Hello friends, welcome back to your UPSC. Today we are going to start with Physiographic Regions of India. So let's get started. So studying about Physiographic re Regions of India, what is Physiography? So Physiography is basically a branch of geography which studies the present relief features of the earth's surface okay or the natural features in their casual relationship okay so all the physical features that are currently existing on the earth surface are studied in physiography okay so all the relief features of india that are currently in position that are studied in physiography of india now as we have studied in geomorphology both exothermic and endothermic forces they work together to form any landform okay so all these landform they are uh, result of these exogenetic forces as well as endogenetic forces okay now india has a unique personality with regard to physiography because in india there is great diversity of relief features encompassed in the vast dimensions of the country dimension of the country okay now in india we have folded mountain flat plains oldest plateaus in the world of the world okay so basically we have everything in india okay now due to geographical complexity and geomorphological diversity the division of india into physiographic region is a dis difficult task but for our convention sake we have divided india on the basis of their physiographic division into five parts okay so these five parts are first is himalayan mountain the great himalayan mountain then we have the great northern plain okay then we have peninsular plateau then coastal plains of india and lastly we have island groups okay so today we are going to study about the himalayan mountain okay so the himalayan mountains they are also named as himadri himachal also himvan okay now the himalayas are the youngest and loftiest mountain chain in the world okay so they are currently also they are in the forming stage okay they are yet also yet also they are forming okay and they are lof loftiest peak on the earth okay they are the mountain chain and they have highest peak in the world okay now length if we consider length of himalayas is 2400 kilometers okay which is over 22 degree long longitudes okay so 22 longitudes are crossed by himalayas okay then width if we see is uh, broad from one side and from one side it is narrow okay so from kashmir side we have broad width okay so it is 500 kilometers width and from the other side that is western side eastern side sorry we have 200 kilometers of width of himalayas okay now these mountain chains have loftiest peak of the world as we have studied we have above four, 14 mountains that have height of 8000 meters and above then we have 20 peaks having height of 7500 meters and above then we have 94 peaks having 7300 meters of height and above and there are several peaks having height over 7000 meters okay so there is a link between himalayas and other high ranges of central asia okay so it is like this and the himalayas there is hindu kush okay so high ranges of asia are linked 
and they are linked with a knot okay this is known as palmer knot okay and it is popularly known as roof of the world okay so it is a connecting link between himalayas and high ranges of central asia okay now from palmer the himalayas extend eastward in the form of an arcuate curve okay so it is like this okay curve which which is convex to south okay it is convex towards south so this is south it is convex towards south okay the southern boundaries of himalayas is well defined by foothills okay and uh, the foothills are 300 meters contour line but the northern boundaries are obscure okay and they merges with the edges of tibetan plateau so southern boundaries are well defined so we have 300 meters contour line i hope you know contour line contour lines are the lines which join points of similar heights okay so 300 meter contour line means this is 300 meter height at various places so the line joining these points is known as 300 meter contour line okay so they have well defined boundary in southern part but in northern part they merges with tibetan plateau also okay so their boundary is not well defined now Himalayas, if we look into their properties, they have high altitude, steep gradient, narrow capped, uh, narrow uh, peaks, okay, and then they have snow covered summits, then they have deeply dissected topography, youthful drainage, complex geological structure, and rich temperate flora in the subtropical latitude, okay. And all these physio physical features that we have uh, just said, they are suggesting that Himalaya is a youth mountain, okay? It is in its young age because uh, Himalayas, as we know, are still in their forming stage, okay? Now we will look into what is the origin of Himalayas, how Himalayas came into origin. Now, several scholars they have expressed their views regarding the origin of himalayas the prominent among them is ohk spade ms krishnan then we have eh pasco okay then many others but there is almost complete unanimity that the himalayas or the himalayan mountain have come from a great geosyncline which is known as tethys sea okay so the status C has been uplifted. Okay, the upliftment of the status C has taken place uh, because of uh, converging plates. Okay, and these converging plates, because of upliftment of status C, the folds that are formed in status C, uh, the geosynclines in status C. Okay, they have formed Himalayas. Okay. Now, many scholars, they say that above about 120 million years ago, the arrangement of the continent and ocean was quite different from what it is today. There was a supercontinent known as Pangaea and the northern part uh, of Pangaea, it consists of uh, North America and Eurasia, that is Europe and Asia, which was called as Laurasia or Angara land and the southern part of the Pangaea constituted of south america africa south india australia and antarctica okay and this landmass was known as gondwana land now in between gondwana land and angara land so this is angara land and this is gondwana land so in between them there was a narrow and shallow sea which was known as tethys sea okay so the sediments were brought from this Angara land, okay, and this Gondwana land, and they were deposited in this Tethys Sea. Now, because of sedimentation, these sediments were subjected to a great powerful compression. So, all the sediments in the Tethys Sea, they were subjected to compression. 
okay these sediments were collected by the rivers okay now these sediments were subjected to compression now we can say that compression was either because of northward movement of gondwana land or the majority of scientists believe that it is the northward movement of gondwana land which caused the compression but we can also say whether it was the northward movement of gondwana land or we can say that it was southward movement of angara land okay so in any case these the sediments in the tethys sea they were squeezed okay and crushed and because of this squeezing and crushing the series of fold were formed one behind the other giving birth to the highest relief features on the earth which are known as himalayas okay and because we have in the uh, see himalayas is not a just one series of mountain okay it is like like we have three series of mountain okay so one behind the other there are three series formed so because of this the scientists believe that because himalayas is having three series which are running parallel to each other so the himalayas is sought to uh, is supposed to be emerged out of tethys sea in three different phases okay so these three different phases were first was the commencement of the first phase commencement was about 1 million uh, 120 million year ago okay so in 120 million uh, year ago the first the range was formed and then 70 after 70 million year ago the second phase was started and it in it the second series was formed and lastly about 25 to 30 million year ago the third phase started and here the last series of the himalayas were formed okay so the the great himalayas were formed in first phase then we have middle himalayas in second phase and lastly we had shivalik that were formed in last stage okay but this theory was not so much accepted okay now the most uh, recent and widely acclaimed theory that is plate tectonic theory which has solved quite a puz uh, different puzzles of earthquake occurrence of earthquake formation of mountain origin of continent and ocean and everything okay so the plate tectonic theory it gave its evidences and its theory about the formation of himalayas so the first theory it was quite good okay but the plate tectonic theory it gave its reason as well as all the stages step by stages so that the formation of himalayas and all its series can be best explained so according to the plate tectonic theory the origin and upliftment of himalayas has taken place in five consecutive stages okay so according to this theory himalaya is are uh, the product of tectonic activities of convergence zone <coughs> so himalayas are the product of convergence zone of asiatic plate or we can also say eurasian plate in the north with the indian plate in the south so this is eurasian plate and this is indian plate so they converged with each other okay and their convergence it led to the formation of himalayas okay now talking about the plate tectonic theory according to this theory the formation and upliftment of himalayas have taken place in five sequential stages now approximately 85 million years ago the location of indian plate was very close to the plate of eurasia okay now the river that originated from the plates deposit their sediments over the bed of tethys sea 
okay so rivers that are originating from here and from here they deposited their sediments in the tethys sea now from such sediments the upliftment and formation of himalayas have taken place okay so these sediments they formed geosyncline okay and from these sediments only in future the upliftment of himalayas will take place okay now approximately 80 million years ago for the first time indian plate it collided with eurasian plate and the compressional thrust thrust between the two plates uplifted the landmass into several sequential ranges okay so this was the first time that the eurasian plate and indian plate they collided okay and because of the, their collision trans himalayas were formed in the western margin okay so the trans himalayas or we can say tethys himalayas were formed now in the next stage that is between 65 uh, million years ago so 65 to 66 million ago year ago indian plate turned anti clockwise okay so it turned anti clockwise now the first major thrust was thrust was produced over the sediment of tethys here okay which uplifted okay so this first major thrust it uplifted and this upliftment formed great himalayas okay so great himalayas were formed in the second thrust which was first major thrust okay so this is first major thrust not the first thrust first thrust it formed trans himalayas after that the indian continent the subcontinent it moved anti clockwise and then the eurasian plate and india uh, indian plate they converged to form the first major th thrust because of which great himalayas were formed okay now the horizontal axis where the force between the two plates became more prominent is known as main central thrust okay so the great himalayas and here you can see here this is main central thrust and from here this is the horizontal axis where the force between two plates it became more prominent okay now by the continuous anti-clockwise rotation of the indian plate the second major thrust was produced over the sediment of tethys to uplift middle himalayas okay now middle himalayas were formed okay the horizontal zone of compression created a fault okay now this fault was known as main boundary fault here you can see after middle himalayas we have main boundary fault okay so this is our main boundary fault that this is middle himalayas okay and these are greater himalayas okay now approximately at last uh, at like 40 million years ago the indian plate it completely fused with eurasian plate so it completely fused with eurasian plate and the final thrust was produced over the sediments to uplift shivaliks okay so the final thrust it formed shivaliks and shivaliks they were formed like 14 million year ago and they were the last series to be formed okay so here you can see we have lower himalayas or shivaliks now the axis where the horizontal force between the respective plates became prominent is known as himalayan forward fault fault okay so this is himalayan forward fault okay so it is a horizontal axis now this stage is also known as closing of tethys sea okay so here after this tethys sea was closed okay now no more tethys sea is present this was the final thrust okay which closed the tethys sea and it was about 14 million years ago so the major fault that we can see here is this is tibet plateau this is itsz 
ओके आई टी एस सेड इज एक्चुअली इंडियन तिब्बतन स्ट्रक्चर जोन जोन ओके एंड हेयर वी हैव ट्रांस हिमालयास देन वी हैव इंडस सेंगपो सेंगपो फॉल्ट ओके सो दिस इज इंडियस इंडियन सेंगपो सेंगपो फोल्ट फॉल्ट देन वी हैव ग्रेटर हिमालयास आफ्टर ग्रेटर हिमालयास वी हैव मेन ग्रेट सेंट्रल थ्रस्ट ओके सो दिस इज ऑल्सो अ फॉल्ट एंड अक्रॉस दीज फॉल्ट ओनली वी एक्सपीरियंस अर्थ क्वेक ओके सो द ग्रेट अर्थ क्वेक दैट हैपन इन नेपाल इट वॉज बिकॉज ऑफ द डिस्टर्बेंसेज इन द मेन सेंट्रल थ्रस्ट ओके नाउ देन आफ्टर मिडल हिमालयाज वी हैव मेन बाउंड्री फॉल्ट एंड लास्टली वी हैव आफ्टर शिवालिक्स और लोअर हिमालयाज वी हैव हिमालयन फॉरवर्ड फॉल्ट ओके सो आफ्टर हिमालयन फॉरवर्ड फॉल्ट वी हैड tethas sea closed okay so the tethas sea was closed after himalayan forward fault now as we have studied the origin of himalayas according to plate tectonic theory also now we will look into basic division of himalayas okay so the division of himalayas according to geographically uh, according to geography so geographically himalayas himalayan region is divided into three basic parts first is the himalayan ranges so himalayan ranges are further subdivided into shivalik ranges the middle himalayas middle or lesser himalayas and lastly the greater himalayas okay then we have second is the trans himalayas and lastly we have the eastern himalayas also known as purvanchal so the eastern himalayas are known as eastern hills or purvanchals okay now first we will look into the himalayan ranges so the himalayan ranges or we can say they are not a single chain of range uh, okay they are not in single chain they are having three consecutive chain of ranges okay and these ranges they are separated from each other by deep valleys and as we have seen in every young fold mountain there is deeply dissected ridge and valley topography and so is the case with himalayas we have deep valleys okay deep and steep valleys as well as lofty steep mountains okay the most outstanding valley in himalayan region are the vale of kashmir the karevas the kangras and the kullu valley in himachal pradesh then we have dun valleys and then we have bagirathi valley then we have mandakini valley in kedarnath uttarakhand then there is kathmandu valley in nepal now the individual range have very steep gradient towards the south but they present a much gentler slope towards the north okay so towards the south they are steep but towards the north they are gentle okay comparatively gentle we can say now in the eastern section of himalayas the himalayas they rise abruptly from the plain of bengal or and avadh and suddenly attain a great elevation within a short distance from the foot of mountain thus the peak of kanchenjunga and everest are only few kilometers from the plain okay and they are clearly visible from there okay so these were the basic characteristic the peaks are perpetually snow covered okay and uh, as we walk 150 to 200 kilometers away from the plain area the peaks are snow covered okay and most of the himalayan ranges they fall in india then nepal and bhutan but the northern slope are uh, partly situated in tibet which is the eastern extreme uh, while uh, sorry some of the part they are situated in tibet also as well as the western extremities of uh, himalayas they lie in pakistan afghanistan and central asia also okay now the parallel ranges of uh, these great himalayas they are in southern they have well defined boundaries and after that we have formation of 
endogangetic plane okay so the ranges are first is shivalik ranges shivalik ranges they comprised uh, comprise of outermost ranges of himalayas and they are also known as outer himalayas okay so with its sudden steep uh, slope it assumes a hog back appearance okay so it is like this so this is like hog back appearance okay now uh, the basic characteristic features of uh, shivalik ranges is flat scarps anticlinal crest and synclinal valleys okay so we have anticlinal crest as well as synclinal valley as and also we have flat scarps okay so these shivalik they extend from jammu and kashmir to arunachal pradesh they are 150 km wide in jammu and kashmir whereas in arunachal pradesh they get very low uh, narrow okay they are about only 8 to 15 km wide and their length is over 2400 km okay the northern limit uh, as we have seen is the main boundary thrust which separate outer himalayas from the lesser himalayas and the southern limit is in indogangetic plain they are the youngest part the youngest part of mountain chain they st stretch from brahmaputra brahmaputra in the east to indus in the west okay now now as the shivaliks they were formed after or we can say at last during the formation of himalayas they obstruct the courses of river, rivers that are draining from higher reaches of himalayas and they form temporary lakes okay so this is higher reaches of himalayas okay so when the river is flowing these shivaliks they obstruct their pathway okay so temporary lakes are formed and these temporary lakes they brought uh, they uh, sorry the rivers they brought bring with them debris okay debris which are deposited in these lakes now after the river has cut their courses through shivalik ranges the lakes are drained away leaving behind a plain okay and these plains are known as dunes okay now they are known as dunes in west and while in east they are known as dwars so the most famous best example of dunes is dehradun okay and dwar we can see that there is haridwar okay so they are dunes and dwars that are formed in this shivalik ranges now these shivalik ranges they are formed sorry they are called by different names in different areas like in jammu and dafla they are known as sorry in jammu they are known as jammu hills then dafla miri abor mishimi hills in arunachal pradesh then danga ranges or in uttarakhand then we have in nepal they are known as churia churia ghat hills okay so they are various name of shivaliks now now we will look into next himalaya next series of himalayas that is the middle himalayas also known as the lesser himalayas and the other name for them is himachals okay so these himalayas they are these series of himalayas they are located between shivalik in the south and great himalayas in the north okay so they are in the middle and they run parallel between both the ranges okay now these system of ranges they are 60 to 80 km wide having elevation varying from 3500 to 4500 meters above the sea level okay now they have also like shivalik they also have typical hog back look and this look is more pronounced than shivalik ranges okay 
there are many many ranges or many peaks sorry many peaks which are more than 5000 meters okay above the sea level so the important ranges includes pir panjal range we have dholadhar range then we have masuri range nag tiba mahabharat lake then okay so these uh, ranges they rise above 5000 meter okay now the pir panjal range it is uh, we have two major ranges first is pir panjal range then we have dholadhar range so pir panjal range it is located in kashmir punjab uh, and the extent is from jhelum river to the upper bias river for over 300 kilometers it separates from zaskar range by the valley of kashmir so it is separated from zaskar range it was a continuous line between uh, there was a continuous uh, range that is zaskar range but because of uh, vale of kashmir it is separated from zaskar range then we have another range that is dholadhar range it is in the southernmost range of lesser himalayas okay it has height of 4000 meter it continues eastward into mahabharat range and it has many glacial lakes like lamdal nag lake okay and some of the well known peaks are kailash kailash mountain then we have toral mountain okay and we have famous kangra valley in himachal pradesh which extends from the foot of dholadhar range now lastly we have greater himalayas which are no, also known as inner himalayas central himalayas or himadri okay they are the northernmost and innermost of all the himalayan ranges they have average elevation of 6100 meter above the sea level and their average width is 25 kilometers okay these are the loftiest and most continuous mountain ranges of the world and it is about 150 kilometers away from the northern edge of the plain of north india okay so it is so if we consider this as the northern plain so the distance between them is 1 150 kilometers okay these slopes also have walk back topography these mountain have arch they are convex to south and they terminate abruptly in naga parbat in the northwest and nancha barwa in the northeast okay so so this is the great himalayas okay so in the northeast and north west so in north west they will terminate in naga nanga parbat and in north east the no, sorry north west north east they will terminate in namcha barwa okay now these mountain ranges they boost and they are tallest peaks of the world hai na now these several peaks are above 8000 meters that we have already seen there are 14 peaks that are above 8000 meters okay and the highest peaks are mount everest which is 8850 meters above the sea level the nepalese name for mount everest is sagarmatha which is also known as goddess of sky and tibetan they call it chaum chaum lunga lungma okay so chaum lungma is the name tibetan name given to mount everest and sagarmatha is the nepalese name given to mount everest and then we have uh, other ranges uh, other mountains like kanchanjunga we have makalu hills 
then we have Dholagiri, Annapurna, Naga Par Nanga Parbat, etc. etc. So there are many range, uh, many mountain peaks in these ranges. So these were the Himalayan ranges. Now we will look into Trans Himalayas and Purvanchal Hills. So Trans Himalayas, they are Himalayan ranges. Immediately they rise immediately north of Great Himalayan ranges and they are also known as Trans Himalayas or we can also call them Tibetan Himalayas. Okay, because most of uh, it lies in Tibet. We have Daskar, Ladakh, Kailas and Karakoram. These are the main ranges of Trans Himalayas. Okay, so these ranges they are actually stretching about 1000 kilometers in east west direction and their average elevation is 3000 meters above the mean sea level and the average width in this region is 40 kilometers of width is there in eastern and west western extremities on average but from the middle from the central part of we see they are about 225 kilometers wide okay now the, uh, the ranges the, they are Karakoram range, Zaskar range, then we have Ladakh range and last is Kailash range okay and in these ranges we have uh, mountain peaks like so we have various high peaks like we have Nanga Parvat uh, which uh, whose, whose height ranges from the uh, ranges to 8126 meters okay then we have mount kailasha whose height is 6714 meters then we have mount k2 which is the second most uh, highest peak in the world whose height is 8611 meters okay so these ranges are in trans himalayas now we will look into the eastern hills or Purvanchals. Now, after crossing the Dihang Gorge, the Himalayas, they suddenly turn towards their south. Okay. And from the south, the series of comparatively low hills starts. Okay. So, the low hills that are running, they are in the shape of crescent and they have a convex side pointing towards west okay now these hills are collectively known as Purvanchal hills because they are located in the eastern part of India so eastern part is also known as Pur Purvan Hindi okay so they are known as Purvanchal now they extend from Arunachal Pradesh in the north to Mizoram in the south they form India's boundary with Myanmar okay they are differently marked from Himalayas in the scale of their relief and in their morphology. These hills are nonetheless the steam of steam of from the same orogeny. Okay. In the north, we have Patkai Bum. Patkai Bum it forms the international boundary between Arunachal Pradesh and Myanmar. Then we have after Patkai Bum, we have Naga Hills, then we have Kohima Hills, then from that we have Manipur Hills, okay, then we have Mizo Hills. So all these hills are the part of Purvanchals, okay. Now Purvanchals, they are also known as, also regarded as ecological hotspot ranges after crossing the Hang George okay so these ranges these Purvanchals have six physiographic regions that is Mishimi Hills and Patkai Bom which is in Purv N-E-F-A okay then we have Nagaland then Manipur Hills then we have North Karakar Hills then we have Mizo Hills and Tripura Hills the Purvanchal Hills they are joined by Meghalaya Plateau in the west. Okay. So this was about the Himalayan ranges. Uh, sorry. The 
division of Himalayas according to their geographical division. Now we will look into the regional division of Himalayas. The regional division of Himalayas was done by Sir Sidney Burrard. Okay, so he divided the entire length of Himalayas into four divisions. So these four divisions are the Punjab Himalayas, the Kumayu Himalayas, the Nepal Himalayas and the Assam Himalayas. So they are the three Himalayas. First we have the Punjab Himalayas which stretches up to the distance of 560 kilometers between the Indus and Satlaj river. Okay, so between Indus and Satlaj river the stretch of Himalaya is known as Punjab Himalayas. The large portion of this sector lies in Jammu and Kashmir and Himachal Pradesh. As a result of which they are also known as Kashmir or Himachal Himalayas. Okay. The Karakoram range, the Ladakh range, Pir Panjal, Zaskar, Dholadhar, these are the main ranges of this section. Okay. The 3444 meter high Zojila Pass provides an easy, easy passage between them. Okay. So in between these the main ranges, there are valleys, there are dunes, there are lakes. Okay. And the general elevation it falls westward okay then we have the kumayu himalayas the kumayu himalayas they are between satlaj and kali river okay so satlaj and kali river the stretch is 320 kilometers long okay and they are the western part of these kumayu himalayas is known as garhwal himalayas whereas eastern part is known as kumayu himalaya proper okay the general elevation is higher as compared to the Punjab Himalayas. We have Nanda Devi, we have Kamet, we have Trishul, Badrinath, Kedarnath and other important peaks. Okay. We have also Gangotri peak here. Okay. The source are sacred. Uh, the source of our sacred river that is Ganga, Yamuna. It is located in Kumayu Himalayas. Okay. There are several dunes between the Middle Himalayas and Shivalik Hills. Nainital and Bhumital are the important lakes in this region. Then we have Nepal Himalayas. Nepal Himalayas, the section of this Himalaya, they stretch from for the distance of 800 kilometers between Kali and Pista. So we had Indus. Satlaj, Kali, Tista, and lastly Brahmaputra. Okay, so between Indus and Satlaj, we have Punjab Himalayas, then we had have Kumayu Himalayas between Satlaj and Kali. Then between Kali and Pista, we have Nepal Himalayas. So these Nepal Himalayas, the distance is 800 kilometers. In Punjab Himalayas, we have distance of 560 kilometers. And in Kumao Himalayas, we have distance of 320 kilometers. Okay. So these Nepal Himalayas, they are mostly lying in Nepal because of which they get the name of Nepal Himalayas. This area, this range, this uh, extent has tallest section of Himalayas and it is crowned by several peaks of perpetual snow line. Okay, we have Mount Everest that is tallest peak in the world. Then we have other major peaks like we have Kanchanjanga, we have Dholagiri, we have Makalu Hills, okay, Kathmandu Hills, we have uh, Kathmandu Valley, which is here, okay. So it is a famous valley of Nepal, which is in this area. Lastly, we have Assam Himalayas, which ranges from Tista to Brahmaputra, and their distance that they cover is five, uh, sorry, 7,050 kilometers wide, okay. So Assam Himalayas, 
they spread over large part of sikkim assam arunachal pradesh and has elevation lesser than that of nepal himalayas the southern slopes are very steep but the northern slope are gentle okay now the lesser himalayas are very narrow and they are very close to greater himalayas so here the lesser himalayas they converge or we can say they are on the verge of converging with greater himalayas okay now the important hills that are present important peaks sorry that are present here are namcha barwa we have uh, chao lahir peak okay so these are important peaks that are present in assam himalayas so these were regional division of himalayas now we will look into the division of himalayas on the map so this is our indian map here we have karakoram range then we have ladakh range daskar range okay then we have kailash range these are the part of trans himalayas so this is karakoram this is ladakh this is zaskar and this last one is kailash okay so these are the part of trans himalayas okay now after this we have great himalayas great himalayas they run from kashmir okay crossing nepal then bhutan and then lastly here so they have convex shape towards the south and they are most continuous ranges in the world so they are great himalayas now these great himalayas they are also known as inner himalayas okay after great himalayas we have lesser himalayas lesser himalayas they run from till here okay and here they come closer okay lastly we have shivalik ranges shivalik ranges they are sorry they also run parallel to the other himalayan ranges that is lesser himalayas and, or the middle himalayas and greater himalayas so the shivalik ranges sorry they don't extend till here they end up here okay so these are shivalik ranges consider them as lesser himalayas okay so this is lesser himalayas then we have shivalik ranges and this is our greater himalayas now after that we have purvanchal hills purvanchal hills after crossing the hang gorge the himalayas they suddenly turn southward okay so these southward they are purvanchal hills now this starts with patkaibam so patkaibam is here then we have naga hills then we have mizo hills okay and here we have garo khasi and jainta hills okay so these are the hills or we can say the geographical division of himalayas now we will look into another map to see the regional division of himalayas this was physical division of himalayas now we will look into regional division of himalayas so 
here we have industry map okay so this is our industry map then this is our sutlej river okay so the a sorry this is our sutlej river so the area between this is the himalayan area between this is punjab himalayas which is also known as himachal himalayas or kashmir himalayas okay now after sutlej we have kali so kali is a part of ganga okay so this is the ganga here so here we have kali so the kali it divides the punjab sorry the nepal himalayas and kumau himalayas now the kumau himalayas they are also known as garhwal himalayas so the western part of kumau himalayas is known as garhwal himalayas and the eastern part is known as kumau himalayas proper then after that we have here we have kali and here we have tista okay so here we have tista so kali and between kali and tista we have nepal himalayas so this nepal himalayas they are between kali and tista okay and this distance is 800 kilometers this is 560 this is 320 Okay. After that, we have Assam Himalayas. Assam Himalayas are between Tista and Brahmaputra. Okay, so Brahmaputra River. So here we have Assam Himalayas. Assam Himalayas, their distance is seven fifty kilometers. So here we have Brahmaputra River, and this is seven fifty kilometers. Okay. So these were the basic division of Himalayas according to region. Now, we will look into another important factor in Himalayas that is syntaxial bending. Now, syntaxial bending is actually a sharp southward bend in east and west extremities in continuous trend of Himalayas. So, Himalayas they are continuously moving, but they actually there is sharp bend in both the extremities okay so this bending is known as syntaxial bending so in eastern no, sorry in eastern part we have purvanchal hills as the eastern syntaxial bending okay and in western part we have suleman ranges we have kirthar ranges as western syntaxial bending okay now the western syntaxial bending it occurs near the naga parvat where the indus river it cut, cuts between the uh, deep jaws and it forms a great knee bend which is some uh, 500 km deep and the effect this effects the strike of ranges and probably as far as the foot of pamir okay now the geological formation takes place and there is sharp hairpin bend okay and this bend is a round pivotal point okay is on a round pivotal point okay and here we have kirthar ranges suleman ranges and this is near pamir nod Here we have Hindu Kush mountain, okay, and here the Indus River it cuts, and here we have Naga Parvat. The eastern syntaxial bend it occurs at the eastern extremity of Himalayas, where the Himalayan range take a sharp bend in the southward direction, and the eastern trend of the ranges terminate here. Okay, the bend is conspicuous in the arunachal pradesh where the mountain ranges turn southward after crossing brahmaputra so here brahmaputra crosses and the himalayan ranges they take a southward cut okay the strike of the range is also a deep knee bend towards the 
south. So this is also a deep knee bend and this is also a deep knee bend. So these are syntaxial bends of Himalayas. Now as we have done the basic information about Himalayas, now we will look into various effects of Himalayas, how the Himalayas, they affect our life. Okay. So we will look into significance of Himalayas. So Himalayas at the com as they comprise of most dominating ge geogra geographical features of India, no other mountain range anywhere in the world has affected the life of people and shaped the destiny of a nation as Himalayas have done with respect to India. Okay, um, we also know that Himalayas, if they were absent, they were not present, then India would have been a cold desert. Okay. So there are few points which bring out the significance of Himalayas. So the first significance of Himalayas is climatic influence. Okay. So the Himalayas, they play a very great significant role in influencing the climate of India. By the virtue of their height and length in direction and also we can say direction. Why? Because Aravli ranges, because their direction is not uh, according to the winds, they are not so much significant in climatic influence as the Himalayas is okay so because the Himalaya they are present like against the winds which are coming from Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea they cause precipitation in the form of rain and snow in India okay now beside that they prevent the cold continental air mass of the Central Asia Okay, Central Asia from entering into India. Had there been no Himalayas, the whole of India would have been a desert in the absence of precipitation and its winter would have been very severe under the influence of cold air mass coming from Central Asia. Okay, now according to the latest meteorological studies, the Himalayas are responsible for splitting of jet stream into two branches that we have already studied in climatology. Okay. Now these jet stream as we know they are very important, they are, ex they are extremely important, they play an extremely important role in bringing monsoon in India. Okay. Then second significance is defense. The Himalayas have been protecting India from outside invaders since the early times thus serving as a defense barrier. Third importance is source of river. Now almost all great rivers in India have been their, have their source in Himalayan ranges. Abundant rainfall, vast snow fields as well as large glaciers are feeding ground for the mighty rivers of India. The snow melt in summers providing water to these rivers. Even during the dry season these are there are hundreds uh, of perennial rivers which are flowing because of melting of ice from Himalayas sorry melting of snow from Himalayas so the Himalayan river along with the hundred of its tributaries form a very basic of life of the whole of North India okay so they are they are basic necessity next is fertile soil now as we have seen there uh, the rivers that flow they bring with them good amount of sediments and the sediments they are deposited on the bank of river now these sediments they are they are very fertile and they are these sediments are known as alluvial so as the river they descend they uh, carry enormous quantity of alluvial and while descending they deposit these alluvial on the banks and these deposits are we can see in great northern plain so the northern part of india is formed of fertile soil making this plain one of the most fertile land in the world okay then we have hydroelectric hydroelectricity the himalayan range it uh, region it offers various sites which provide us with hydroelectricity okay because there are various natural waterfalls at certain places 
while we can also construct them across the river at some other places so we have vast potential of, of power in himalayan ranges which still awaits for proper utilization so if this potential is utilized properly then india would have good amount of power and we won't need any other non renewable we won't rely on any other non renewable source of energy for at least electricity okay then we have forest belt the himalayan ranges are very rich in forest region okay in their altitude the himalayan ranges show succession of vegetal cover okay from the tropical to alpine vegetation okay the himalayas they provide fuel wood and large variety of raw materials for the forest based industries now beside this there are many medical plants that grow in himalayas then several patches are covered with grass which are good for or which act as rich pasture land for grazing animals now next point is agriculture though himalaya does not offer extensive flat land for agriculture but some of the slopes are terraced for cultivation now rice is the main crop on terraced slope then other crops like wheat maize potato tobacco ginger are also grown tea is a unique crop which can be grown on hill slopes only so tea is grown here and because we have himalayas and we have these great mountains india is number one producer of tea but it is also a uh, number one consumer of tea because of which most of the tea that is produced is domestically consumed and we are not able to export quite a huge amount of tea in the world okay next is tourism by the virtue of their scenic beauty and healthy environment the himalayan ranges have been developed uh, as a large tourist spot now the hilly areas in the himalayas they offer cool and comfortable climate while the neighboring plains are reeling under the scorching heats from the summer season okay so million of tourists from different part of the country as well as from abroad they throng in himalayas for tourism as the center of in enjoying natural beauty okay and escaping summer heat of the plain now because of increasing popularity of winter sport and craze to enjoy snowfall there is increased rush of tourist in winter so there are various spots like shrinagar dalhousie dharamshala we have shimla we have kullu manali masuri darjeeling nainital rani khet almora so these are important tourist centers of himalayas in himalayas okay now then we have pilgrim spot apart from so this was tourism apart from um, this enjoyment tourism or medical tourism we also have religious tourism so pilgrimage is also a interesting part in himalayan tourism so himalaya has been studded with scantified shrines which which are considered to be abode of gods okay so large number of pilgrimage uh, through different terrains are tracked to pay their reverence to these secret shrines okay so large number of tourists they come so various shrines are like mount kailash we have amarnath we have badrinath kedarnath vaishno devi then we have uttarkashi gangotri yamunotri they are important places of pilgrimage and last but not the least himalayan region contain many valuable minerals and there is vast potential of mineral oil in the tertiary rocks okay the coal is found in kashmir copper lead zinc nickel cobalt antimony then we have tungsten gold silver limestone we have semi precious precious stones in the uh, himalayas then we have gypsum and then we have magnesite which are also known to occur 
in more than 100 localities in Himalayas. But unfortunately, many of the mineral resources cannot be exploited at the present level of technology due to adverse geographical condition. Okay, but in future, after the advancement of uh, advancement in modern technology, we may be able to exploit these resources. So the future possibility of mineral exploitation in Himalayas are great. So this was about Himalayas, and this was the first. These uh, the Himalaya is the first physiographic region of India. Then we have Great Northern Plain. Then we have Peninsular Plateau. Then we have coastal region and island groups to cover the whole physiography of India. So guys, that was all for today. I hope you enjoyed. So let's meet in our next class. Till then, take care and have a nice day.